announce we're, um, we're being recorded, um, visually and auditorily. Um, and a public comment period. Let me go to the farm survey. I do. Oh, actually, as you, as you stand up there. Um, uh, I'm not sure, I think Doug, Doug Rennick has kind of stopped. What? <laughs> I know, I think we're going to have lost him for a moment. We have, this is the second time he hasn't shown up, so we need someone to take minutes. He got his tax right off. That's, That's right. right. I think so, yes. Well, actually, he worked, I think he worked beyond his tax work off. But he might have, yeah. Um, but I, I wasn't. I didn't. Start, I didn't hear from him one way or the other. But he hasn't shown up twice now. And, and the question maybe about maybe he doesn't get the minutes in the mail thing to know that there's really, you know. Right. That, well, he's in my email list. Although well, I even so, had problems with that today. I hear. But, um, oh, but he, he should have gotten it from me by email. Oh, from you? Uh, yeah, directly. Instead of from the city. Oh, yeah, right. right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm um, Chris. I'm happy to take notes. They, they won't be as great as the seven minutes. Okay. Oh, it's, uh, you have to be soon, and I can use my, you know, memory and any notes I take. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to write up the email. Okay. 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 okay great. Yeah. Okay. Public comments. Adele. Hi, everybody. Last meeting, we talked a little bit about the possibility of a new net zero stretch code for the state and the um, SBBRS was going to be having a hearing. Actually, they had one um, two days ago. But they asked the people not go to that hearing to speak about a net zero stretch code because they wanted to have a whole special hearing on that topic. So that's been postponed. But um, it would be really handy to get a lot of support for a net zero stretch code. And um, I, I got in touch with someone I know who's very active in the Massachusetts Municipal Association. And she said that it's not on the MMA um, radar. So if you all have some way to get that on the MMA radar, it would be really nice for the MMA to be strongly in support of the net zero stretch code when the SBBRS gets around to considering that topic. And uh, I think it would be highly beneficial if you all as a commission wanted to send in a letter in support of that uh, directly to the SBBRS. Um, so um, I, I'm also I'm also going to speak about a, a different topic. It's different but related. It's related to uh, building codes, <clears throat> but not the stretch code. It's actually related to the base code. Um, <clears throat> the Massachusetts Climate Action Network had a webinar two days ago uh, about this topic. And I found it extremely interesting, and um, so, and you may all, you all probably know much more about this than I do, but what, um, but the important thing is that there's an international energy conservation code that the SBBRS bases our base code on, and that each state gets to vote on this IEEC, IECC code. Um, and Massachusetts gets 2,000 votes, but last, time the cycle happened, only 100 votes from Massachusetts were submitted. So we have an enormous opportunity to you know, increase the amount of votes that we have. And as a municipality, we get, because of the size of our municipality, and I think Chris has handed out this, this handout, um, if you get four votes for a municipality of our size for each municipal entity that registers. So if four, four of the Northampton entities register, that gives us 16 votes. So last time I found out, it was only Mr. Hasbrook who voted from our, our city, but we could probably have 16 or more votes this coming cycle if we get lots of departments registered. Costs money. I, I it's $135 for each department that registers is what it says here. I think it's... I think it's annual. We pay we pay three year bites, but um, it's not a one time. Just the one the membership that we, that our department has is, is annual. Okay, I'll um I'll I'll also inquire about about that. But if your experience is that it's annual, then that makes it pricey. Right. Um, so I just I just wanted to you know to bring up the issue that potentially we could have a lot more votes and we could get a better code um, and January 1st is when registration starts uh, it, and registration ends on March 29th so we have we have some time to consider it 
and I will try to get some more information about whether each department that registers has to pay an annual fee or not. That, that would certainly add up if we added more departments. So, uh, it could be, and you know, it might be different. I mean, I know what our relationship with the ICC <coughs> is, and, and, and to maintain that, we have cost us um, that much a year. Yeah, well, that would certainly add up. But my understanding is that you all could register, the, the mayor could register, the, the health department can register, the planning department can register, so and then each each department that registers gets four votes of something to consider. At, at a minimum we could have four votes. Mm -hmm. right. And I think actually I think at one time you registered me, Louis, so we yeah, I think you're still registered. I think yeah. there's yeah. Um, the one that uh, actually two of the other people have subsequently left so I can register <coughs> if right. I two slots. And then we just need no. one of them. But one of them slots. Yeah. So we can get at least four votes. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, for the hundred and thirty five dollar right. monthly year fee. Right. And then you can vote when you actually get down to voting. Apparently it takes like forty five minutes or so to vote. You could actually do it together in the same room to make it a little more interesting. Sure. Open vote test. <laughs> no. Not only that, but um, there's some organization that sends you a pamphlet and gives its recommendations about how you should vote on each <laughs> Oh, that's helpful. <laughs> the, the, so all the departments are under the aegis of the mayor. So you might be a one-stop shopping if you go and make an appeal to the mayor directly, because they all, you know, it's, it's the mayor is the executive. Of that. City so. council isn't that? No, city council isn't. So oh, the city, city council, council could register. Can register. Yeah. <coughs> we might even have a budget. I'm not sure. <laughs> but <yeah>. maybe. <laughs> I've got a fancy question. Yeah. So is this about voting on <laughs> the next IEC code nationally or, or voting for Massachusetts to adopt? I believe oh, each state gets to adopt whichever provisions it wants, and that's what you're voting on is which of the provisions in the IECC code you want to be in the Massachusetts space code. That's my understanding, but you know, I have a lot more to learn about this. Okay. I thought we just point to that IEC code. No, I mean Massachusetts adopted the, you know, the it's the 2015 version of the IECC, and then they amended, and they amended in a very, it's 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 obtuse to say the least. They they adopt the ICC code, and and they go to the energy conservation chapter of that code and then they say when you get here go to the IECC and then there's but here's some amendments to it I see. Um, and and the amendments are what the adoption of that code is pretty well um, established they're going to go with the next when they do the next code they're going to adopt this the IECC again it's what they put in it for amendments and it was more, the Massachusetts stretch code was more stringent until this last code cycle. Now the stretch code's a little more stringent than the base code, and they're talking about a stretch code becoming more stringent again, you know, increasing the difference between base code and stretch code. Right. Next co code cycle. Right. But we do have a Republican government. What? Yeah, I think there's a component in that green community is that from 2008 that requires us to adopt the IEC yes. within a year of it being published. Right, every three years. So, but no, no, but but that doesn't happen. Right, uh -huh. we went from 2009 IECC to the 2015 IECC, so it wasn't within a year. And we didn't even get we got the 2015 IECC in the beginning of 2017. So we're not we're not the state's not keeping up with it. I see. It's despite the fact that that's what it says. But the reason that each state has as many votes is because that determines what amendments the state is adopting, correct? No, you go to the, you go to the, to the meetings and you make your presentations for, for an amendment and then and the board ultimately decides and votes on whatever code gets promulgated. At the IEC, at the IEC? No, at the, at the state. At the state. Right. And the IECC, they're working on the um, uh, 2021 
version now, I think. Right. And so, and those are the amendments that the ICC has coming up. The, you know, the, you, the, you vote on possible uh, changes to the code or to the version. That would take effect in 2021. 2021. And then if and then and then it'll come to Massachusetts and whenever Massachusetts gets to the 2021 IEC. Okay. So what you would be voting on is the amendments that the IECC is considering. Is that right? The changes they're considering for the 2021 code on the national level. On the national level. Yeah. And then eventually Massachusetts will adopt that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Amend it. Hopefully, Massachusetts amendments generally make it more stringent. Uh -huh. Just across the board, Good. there's not much that lets people off the hook. Mm -hmm. right. So, so Adele, on this form, it says zero to fifty thousand only get maximum number of votes is four. Yeah, but then if you read underneath, I, we're, we're just reading the qualifying language, yeah. and I've got to say, yeah. I don't understand. I, I have been <laughs> I have been asking them this question ever since I, the webinar, and they keep assuring me that is each entity gets four votes. Yeah, what they're doing is they're saying they're, 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 they're saying city council is an entity. Right. Well, Building also, department is an entity. But, but it's based the, on population size. No, so but up at the top it ah. says renew their membership with the international unit. They're eligible to register four, eight, or twelve voting representatives depending on their town's population. But oh, okay. that doesn't say that you can't have more than one governmental member. Right. It just means that each governmental member in a town of our a city of our size has only four votes. Exactly. Right. Like, and so city council could get four. Right. I guess be numerous okay. governmental members from Northampton. There is but much. Everyone right. would only get four. Exactly. Votes. Yeah, it's, that's it's what it's it very means. unclear. I agree. And they say that a, a, a governmental well, I guess it's a member. Okay. What else? So should we come back to this next month? Just review this again. Um, I, um, in the squirrel of trying to get uh, a, a slide presentation up, I, I, I missed the first thing I wanted to have on the agenda, actually, is to um, welcome Rich Parsletti, who has um, been appointed by Donna. Uh, so for the, for, for the DPW's position, Rich will be joining us from now on. Thank you. Lucky Rich. Nice to have you here. We're out of bounds with the gender numbers. Yeah, we're kind of, kind of. Thanks to you. <laughs> I'll see you next year though. <laughs> <laughs> What's your role at DPW? I'm the city's uh, superintendent of the Forestry Parks and Cemetery Division. I'm also the city street warden. Uh, tree warden. Oh, cool. Yeah. Right. You used to run the streets. Yeah. You used to run the streets. I used to. Right. Used to, used to <laughs> right. That sounds really bad, though. <laughs> <laughs> or good, depending on. Yeah. Hey, Rich, you probably know everybody here but Aiden? Yes. Okay. I, don't meet, I don't believe I've ever met Aiden. It's me, Aiden Maynard, uh, citizen member. Thank you. Okay, well, I give a quick, give an idea of where your background is? Sure, I do uh, energy consulting for building energy, mostly in construction, retrofit. Also, former chair of this committee. Uh, yes. yes. Right. Now, we'll try to um, uh, remember to do this again as new citizen members, are, are, could be, we have others as well. Okay. They're not here. All right, thank you. You get to know, know who they are. Okay, um, uh, I would do, uh, take a motion to review and approve the minutes so of moved. November 8th. So moved. Yeah. Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? Abstain. One abstention. And no. Okay, um, Wayne. Um, oh, actually, no. I'm sorry. One more thing, real quick. Um, the Smith Folk. Uh, I, I guess uh, I'm pretty sure what it is is a lightning strike hit somewhere near the Smith Folk PV array, and it knocked out our data acquisition system. It took us a while to kind of figure that out, but we finally did go up down to that, and um, we didn't lose any data for reporting for SREX, so that it maintained that data in the time that it was down. But we gone ahead and replaced it, and the mayor has agreed himself that since it earns the money, the revolving fund might very well be the one that wants to pay for this. It's $585. So 
So I would accept a motion. I moved the uh, 585. Um, five. Actually, yeah. let me get the exact amount. You want to do that? Yeah, that will help. Yep, there are proof it wasn't a baseball that did it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't even know. It's inside the inverter. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, it is 585 and zero zero. Okay, so, so I, I move that we approve $585 and be uh, used applied towards the repair of the data system for the um, SVHS's uh, solar array. Okay, second that. And now, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. 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 Now, Wayne, climate resiliency and regeneration plan. How did you? Okay. Uh, how did it turn out, though? It was good. It was, uh, you know, maybe twenty-five in the afternoon. We were there, mm -hmm. um, and so we had stakeholder meetings again uh, on yesterday, day before. Yesterday. Yesterday. It was yesterday. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed it. And then the evening it meeting was, was Tuesday. More? Oh, yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, I'm sorry. Ella and I were there. I missed yesterday, period. So, sorry. It, okay. it, it, I, I got to know you then. All right. And then more in the evening. The evening had people sort of wandering and wandering out. So we probably had 40 <coughs> different bodies, although probably never more than 30 at any one time. So it's a good discussion. Um, so, we're, so the current plan is for the consultant to finish the plan maybe in February. Um, we get to adopt it after that, so we're having to, so this is, yesterday was the, or Tuesday, was the last of the public forums and the stakeholder meetings. Um, but once the plan's all done, we'll go back to the community and sort of test it in more detail and get people's comments. My experience is at each step as the plan gets more and more detailed, the number of people who comment gets smaller, right? Because it takes a lot more work. So we're still get people involved, you know, we, We've been harvesting all the names of people coming, and we're going to invite them all. And we have, you know, planning list serve as 1,100 people. You copy it yours regularly. Some of the counselors copy it. So we do a good outreach for doing it, but we're going to get fewer and fewer people. We've always seen there's sort of four sources of data for doing the plan. One is sort of the public outreach process, both the stakeholders and public meetings. One is this group, the planning board, and then city staff and city boards. Um, and so this is sort of your chance to have the conversation. I'd love to get comments as soon as we can. I pass it to a lot of information we're going over today, and I don't expect you all to be able to go through everything right now, but my hope is we can sort of run through quickly and get big picture comments, and then if people are willing to have homework, to look at this and, and email me more comments. I don't want to wait till your January meeting, I want to send the consultant feedback. But we send them the consultant feedback, we'll get a revised version, and then I'll come back to January. So if you forget something, you haven't lost the chance. But the more comments I get earlier, the more effective it is. Um, so let me, I'll walk you through this quickly. For those of you who went to one of the public forums, <coughs> the first five pages are just a larger version for those of us who don't have straight eyes. Um, and that was a deliberate subset. Again, trying to make the public process work, we didn't ask everyone everything. So the first five, again, is the, the repeat of that. And then there's another nine pages that I, sorry, the font's even small, even at the scale, and that's the full list. So that's a more detailed list. Some of those who went through the public and some we didn't. Um, so my inclination, I'm, I'm, just how much time do I have? I don't want to take away from, it's okay, you, um, yeah, you've got enough time. Okay. Um, yeah. So my inclination is just sort of go through each item quickly. Sort of each item, pause for a second. If people have thoughts, give me the thoughts. If you want to spend more time, you spend time do an email. Um, and I'm going to start again, say when we did for the public meetings, and then in more detail. Okay, so let me put it so you got a half hour. Okay. So All right, that's sounds perfect. Um, just if you don't mind, you know, nudge me. Yeah, exactly, because that's not okay. working. <laughs> okay, I have my wife. So, all right, I'll be done at five. So we, we're basically as far as we get by um, So let me just walk you through. So Chris has already talked about the Community Choice Energy Plus program. Um, we expect on Monday to make an announcement about a grant that we are very optimistic we're going to get um, that lets us go deeper in weeds for this piece. So this is community aggregation. Lots of communities have 
but much deeper to sort of, you know, do a lot of things that a few communities in California are doing and sort of exploring it. Um, you know, pause it for a second. And this is a clear, just so it's clear, I mean, officially what the mayor has charged Chris and I with is being part of this committee to explore this, the plan is making a stronger statement. It's not saying explore, it's saying launch. Um, so next one is actually two things together. So energy disclosure and energy benchmarking, the way the term's usually used is disclosure means to say what your energy footprint is for your building. Um, and disclosure means, and benchmarking means at certain thresholds to fix up your building. So typically these are larger commercial buildings. These are, that's what I was gonna ask. Commercial, yeah. not residential properties. Uh, certainly for the benchmarking, the place where we expect you to make changes. Some communities are doing for rentals, are trying to do disclosure, figuring the market works. Let renters know what the energy footprint of the building is, and there, they will make the right decision. There hasn't been any pushback by making law about that? Has any pushback what? Uh, relative, I mean, because you're saying making an ordinance that would establish this, has there been So the places in this state that are doing it are frankly richer. So Cambridge is doing this, but Cambridge can demand anything right. they want from the business community. Yeah. You know. So yes, it's only doing pushback. Um, but you could always, I mean, the way you get around the pushback to some extent is what's the threshold? Is this right. just buildings over 100,000 square feet that maybe is only Smith College and Coke, or is it, you know, where, where exactly you draw those lines? Cambridge, are there for residential units? No, oh, for commercial residential, you know, about some number of units, but much of the threshold. Okay. Yeah, no place else in the state is doing this? Boston's? No, Boston's not doing this. Don't know the answer. Cambridge is the one that sort of everyone talks about. Okay. Um, I mean, New York City does too. But. Yeah, it's certainly not unique around the country for, for doing it. Um, but obviously, you can guess. You know, if you have a, you know, a, a skyscraper of Boston's a million square feet, it's a little bit easier to demand than if you have, mm -hmm. you know, our average building is a lot right. smaller. Um, have you did you consider incorporating residential in here, or is it too controversial? Or? Uh, we're deliberately vague to figure out what those thresholds are. So, <coughs> so the recommendation is to launch, and we can come back and. Do um, so, uh, apply resilience and regeneration quotient. Um, so, projects above 2,000 square feet require a site plan approval from the planning board. Um, and the planning board has criteria which says compliance with sustainable Northampton plan. And they look at projects and people get to say how they're being sustainable. But it's not. Um, uh, it's not a clear set of criteria. It's not a clear set of measurable criteria. So this would say, if it's by certain resiliency and or regeneration goodies, and the developer would get lots of choice. Some might want to put solar panels up. Some might want to do battery backup. Some might want to do you know, green infrastructure on the site. But figure out what it is. Again, the, de you know, the devil's in the details. This just says that's a, that's a way to move forward. Uh, there should be site plan and special permit. Here. And so these could be everything from, you know, Boston requires buildings of a certain size, and they're big buildings, to be lead, I think it's gold, to a certain level. So, you know, you, you could do that, those kinds of things. Um, again, education at least. Do we actually go into incentives for home improvements? Um, you know, energy efficiency home improvements? Uh, the heat pumps, which Chris and, and some of you are already working on. You know, do we incentivize it? Do we, is there anything we can do beyond incentivizing it? Um, obviously, it's a big one long term, but build, if you remember, just so you remember, this is a plan that should be guiding us between here and 2050. So it's not that we expect to go to city council tomorrow, but if we're really going to be net energy neutral by 2050, we, need, we know we need to do these things. So think about that. Just, that's a long time schedule that's out there. Um, and oddly enough, under state law, this is actually easier to do than things that seem more obvious. So you email the thing about requiring PV panels on, on a roof. That potential, you, we're not allowed to do things in zoning, which the state building code covers. So requiring PV is potentially runs afoul of state building code. But giving people different ways to get somewhere is fine. So build, so boss requires lead for buildings built a certain size. And they could justify because there's 50 different ways to get, or 100 different ways to get to lead standards. Some are energy efficient buildings, some are recycling content, all that sort of stuff. So requiring that 
zero energy could be a super efficient building. It could be rooftop TV. It could be buying wrecks from <coughs> wind power in Montana. They would all they could all get to the same place. So wait, um, on this one. I mean, as you, as you have it down through, the way it's worded, just kind of glancing at it quickly, incentives, you're talking about monetary incentives for the most part. Um, or regulatory incentives. Or regulatory incentives. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm thinking another way of helping out is, you know, training of, of uh, make, making sure your local installers um, are well trained. Yeah. Uh, making sure that they know, you know, how to, uh, how to design a system so it works well. Uh, in other words, I'm wondering if this could be make sure that the wording allows us the flexibility um, you know to, to provide incentives in a broader way basically yep. you know making the entire system work better yep. or, okay. or add a new strategy that does that yeah that makes sense yep. frankly the reason the incentives are all in red is i told them to take them all out so that's sort of for discussion purposes because i didn't want it this to be committing city resources that may or may not exist wayne i would also um argue that Regulatory incentives is a disingenuous concept. I think regulatory means requirements. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's incentivizing in the sense that it's regulating that people have to do it. So just to, to be honest about what we're saying. Right, right. Just, just, just you know, using the term, I don't disagree with you, but so in downtown, basically the districts are about a mile of downtown, if you want to have more than seven dwelling units, which is, we don't get very often, you need to do a few different things. You have some choices. You have a building that's LEED certified, I think we said silver, I can't remember, or it's residential, her rating below 29, I think, I can't remember the exact number, or units that are below 1,200 square feet. Some, some mix of units are below 1,200 square feet to meet part. So it's often, that, that's right, I mean, you're right, we're demanding stuff, but often you're giving people a choice. You can choose you know, the old Chinese menus to get some flexibility that might happen to fit what the developer's trying to do. So yes, it is. Team. Regulatory choices. Or choices. Something. Yeah. It's okay. Not incentives. Okay, that's fair. Um, in some communities, maybe which the incentives is given more density, but we have a hard time with that because we've already said density is a good thing, and so we already allowed it. We already, frankly, allowed more density than developers want. So it's not really something. Are you about to add in like a required checklist, like another component to? Um, planning review or approval process? Yes. So that's what the idea is of that one, now I lost already. Motion? Yeah. Three. BE3. So they, um, in Connecticut, the rebate program that brand new construction residential requires you to do a, a zero energy solar ready checklist. And it's pretty extensive. Yeah. You really have to think about your siting. And the idea is you're doing this ahead of time, not to force somebody to do PV, but it gives them, it makes them go through the process of exploring whether you know, they can just tilt yeah. the house a little bit, or you know, how much PV can go um, running conduit, which is coming to the code. I believe anybody's in the next code cycle. I don't know, it's EV, EV or not. Um, so it might be something to consider. Yeah, something's already sense. developed. We do something like that for transportation uh, projects above twenty-five thousand square feet. Have to go through an sort of exercise of how can they reduce their trips, and then they mostly can ignore it. But a few people have taken advantage. Smith College, the most notably. They decide to save a couple million dollars in the parking garage and then implement a lot of soft solution space in that checklist. Wayne, kind of related to that, I think, is um, not necessarily requiring solar panels, but thinking about the requirement of footing or the ability to install footing for solar. So we would require rooftop solar. I mean, rooftop, the roofs be solar ready. Okay. And that city council just stopped within the last yeah. six months. Oh, that's why I thought of it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's good, yes. Good rethinking. <laughs> that's a great idea. <laughs> um, so minimum free board okay. departments. Again, this is something that arguably has some challenge with the state building code. We think there are ways to do it. Building code. So the FEMA sets a base flood elevation. Building code says how much above that base flood elevation is the bottom floor of a building needs to be different standards for police stations than there are for, you know, gas stations, um, but play with increasing that. Um, you may know, but this is a big deal. The city is just kicking off a five-year process of modernizing our floodplain maps. They were last done in 1974. So if we do this every 40 years, it has to get it right. Um, but that's scary for us right now. It's possible that all the area along Pleasant Street right. 
it's all going to become the floodplain. Wow. So. I don't know. That's scary. Yeah. Then you see no more development plus the street. Right. Um, right. Uh, Moat City White Electric Vehicle Adoption. <coughs> Obviously, the city's already been working on this. But you know, you go to the next step of requiring commercial parking lots above a certain size of EV chargers. You know, we require bike parking, for example, for certain thresholds. You could do the same thing. Um, the, the next would actually two things. I ask them to split up the denser development patterns. You know, I, I always quote Bill when the zoning for URB and URC finally passed council after two years discussion. It was a unanimous vote, and it was Bill who said, you know, we adopted the state of Hampton. If that means anything, we have to talk about, you know, development the little area. So this is sort of the same idea. Um, uh, and then the, the public transit, you know, we tend to use the figure of if you don't have 20 dwelling units per acre, you don't get transit. And yet people on Ryan Road think we should extend buses after Ryan Road. So right. part of just sort of linking together, you shouldn't expect transit to place there. Um, we're going through exactly the same thing as Sunday for Valley Bike that people want valley biking places that just don't have the density to support it because they act as. So you're basically telling people that you make your neighborhood more dense, we'll bring it to you? Yeah, I mean that, you know, there's uh -huh. nothing wrong with people living in suburban areas or rural areas, but they shouldn't expect some of the urban amenities, uh -huh. like transit and valley bike yep. and recreation. Right. So is that just based on density numbers? It's not also based on income in particular neighborhoods or anything along? And it's based on all those things. It's a quick and dirty, how does things work? Yeah, it varies dramatically. It's also largely, frankly, based on how good it is. So the bus from Northampton to Amherst um, is what's called um, the choice riders. People have cars and have resources to ride the bus, which is good. The bus to Florence Heights, which is pretty lousy and slow, is the term is transit dependent riders. No one in the right mind is going to take that bus if they have a car because it takes forever to get there. So uh, the quality of the bus, I mean, <laughs> lots of things make a difference. This, wait, does this sound? Um, no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it does, uh, but this is the reality in terms of the transit. Because you don't, you know, there's, there's right, if it's 45 minutes from Northampton to Florence, people of the choice aren't going to take the bus. No. So, yes, it's lots of things. 20 is sort of a, the quick shortcut. That you just, um, uh, uh, equitable access to transportation initiatives, right? One of the ways we serve the people who don't necessarily have good access to cars. This goes back to that. Transit independent riders and Valley Bike, you know, the Valley Bike Share Station on Jackson Street doesn't make sense from a usage standpoint. It was done as part of our commitment for this exact goal. We saw the station for how to use this. Um, bike Share Program. Uh, next one. The obvious. Um, design Centers for Stormwater Infrastructure. So we have a $400,000 grant right now that's planning the that we're working together on to promote more green infrastructure, um, but you know, what are the next steps? And, and, um, our standards are already pretty good at requiring green infrastructure, but what are the next steps that we can focus on doing? Um, uh, composting programs, probably self-explanatory. Rest, this was actually interesting, deep in the weeds, that's probably my comment to them. Some of these other things are more general, this one's very specific, but what the restaurants for Green Restaurant Association specific standards, and I don't know about the program. That's why right here. It probably link the real two. Is what? Right, and that, uh, the one above. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. and was that raised by restaurant owners and managers? No, nope, this came from the result. Just came, okay. Yeah. So one, one comment I have on this whole section, Wayne, yeah. is um, there's stuff for recycling, there's stuff for compost, and there's nothing for waste. Perfect. Yeah, yeah you're, you're basically skip the <laughs> right, right. So we're to see if it will bulk the when we get the deeper ones, we'll see if they get there or not. But I'll, uh -huh. I'll check on that. Yeah. One general com comment about this section. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of regulation, a uh, new innovative program. There's not a lot of alternative optional um, certificate like uh, or award program. So helping um, stakeholders stand out because they want to. Because I want to showcase what they do. This is summary. Um, just kind of general, general whether it's okay. for restaurants, for energy. Yeah. You know, so it's like I'm thinking like the MLS listing might not require yeah hers ratings or energy performance to be listed, but if you do, can you be celebrated for that? Yeah. From the city in a way that showcases that property, or you know, a restaurant chooses to be green, not because they have to, but they get some kind of. Um, 
awareness. Yeah, okay. So maybe that, that addresses my comment about SWW3 being too in the weeds. Maybe it should be a general thing. Encourage those sort of civic mm -hmm. programs and think about how do we honor those. Yeah, stuff. so instead of regulation, like instead of stick, it's more yep. care. Like how do we celebrate the leaders in our community across yep. all these things? And we, we, we we'll do that if we're uh, um, mm. people paying a living wage, employers paying a yeah. living wage. So yeah. And they're acknowledged every year in the council. And, yeah. yeah. To some extent, lead. You know, my office has a head. I think we still have it. Has a landing page about all the lead buildings in town. Um, yeah, that's good. Point. Yeah. Wayne, maybe this is getting too into the weeds for this section, but it doesn't. It talks about the the compostable materials, but it doesn't talk about how and where and creating the land and the space for the composting. It doesn't talk about anaerobic digestion as yeah. one of the possibilities. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if there's. Um, some place to have a kind of how in this section. Yep. And um, just to encourage us to look for things like grants for to purchase anaerobic digesters or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. And one of the things yeah. that we need to think about too is what things make sense at a regional scale. So Holyoke's looking at doing anaerobic digestion. And so if their sludge is, because sludge is going to be the biggest part of that, you know, is do we play with Holyoke and do that kind of thing. So um, we also had that. Um, that presentation last year from the people that were doing that, what was the carbon production thing, the, the burning, yeah. remember that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I remember that. Field, the was it production, was it presentation to City Council? Or? No, no, here. No, was this the bio chart? Bio yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Tom Burton. Yeah, anyway, so they're just options that, you know, in terms of the how that I think could be. Yes, exactly. Okay. So actually when I said waste, I was talking about uh, solid waste. But we're also talking, yeah, yeah we've missed um, waste water as well. Yeah, not part of this. Okay. Again, maybe deeper in the weeds later. But yeah, okay. I'll definitely yeah. note to make sure we get it. Okay, good. Um, invest in green infrastructure. Um, richest area. So yell at rich. Is not right. well. <laughs> uh, tree and forest vulnerabilities. So tree committee working with rich has done some of this for street trees, <clears throat> but this is sort of looking more broadly at, you know, non trees, um, and this might be more for remote sensing than direct measuring or retrieving. Um, food systems and farmer resilience plan. Going, done. going back to the previous one, yep. just um, management of invasives. Yep. Because that's a big piece, or a there's thing. a whole piece around uh, the use of pesticides and herbicides, and that's how we're managing them now, and what are the long-term effects of that, and so just managing um, invasives. Yeah. There, there is a there is a, um, a whole one. NFF five. The next page is on invasives. So maybe that's what. Yeah, but maybe they should be linked together. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. When you talk to climate people, everyone seems to agree we're going to get wetter and have bigger storms. But there's actually a disagreement whether in New England it's going to get warmer or cooler. Warmer is obvious, but the cooler is at some points the Gulf Stream stop working very effectively, um, and then we actually get cooler us in Northern Europe, it's cool. So a lot of this stuff is unpredictable. This one. one more thing. Uh, so on um, NFF1 here, Investing yeah. Green Infrastructure, the title Investing Green Infrastructure sounds very, very broad, but it's basically um, uh, talking about uh, uh, stormwater management. Yes. Right. Well, to some extent, street trees fit in that as well, in terms of, of um, okay. or urban heat island. Yeah, but I, I can spell that, you know, stormwater and urban heat island. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that it was broad enough that if we wanted to, you know, look at other things besides just stormwater, um, or again add another another strategy if we need to. Yep. Okay. Uh, food systems and farm resilience. As you know, you know, we invest a lot. Um, Congress School did a, a food plan I don't know, a decade ago, and uh, Grove and Northampton has done a lot, but sort of taking this to the next step. Schools. Wayne on that one. What's so, that? I enjoyed you. No, go ahead. Sorry going on to the next one. Just, um, CESA also did a big study um, two or three years ago on um, sustainable food systems. Okay. And one of the things that came up repeatedly there that I think could be useful to explore, to have in here, just so we don't lose it completely. I, mean, I think we should look at what they did, because we don't need to recreate the wheel around this particular topic when they did such an incredibly in-depth yeah. study. But one of the things that strikes me that's missing here is looking at food distribution 
systems because um, a lot of cities now are creating um, uh, permanent infrastructure for farmers markets or for other ways of distributing local food. Yep. So um, I'd like to see that in here as well. Yeah, those things. And I think, Adele, were you involved with the Keep Farming effort? Yes. So we've had some of those components. We haven't necessarily put them all together for the so. uh, Job training career de development is probably heavily in, in energy, and obviously Smith Oak is a leader. Um, as Chris said, it's invasive. This is both plants and animals. Um, but it's also broader. I mean, the example I keep giving of it is you know, the southern mosquitoes we found in traps next to tires with tire services. So getting rid of tires and landscape is more important in terms of actors than it used to be. So how all those things fit together. Um, we don't see partner network. This could be at lots of different levels. You know, this is sort of the how do people take care of their neighbors and whether it's the, the good neighbors program or whether it's you know, things that the senior center does, and there's lots of individual efforts out there. And, and really, libraries talk about kind of they, what's their role in this group, so sort of putting it all together. Um, strong and Healthy Neighborhoods Program. Um, sort of, it's, the, it's, the, it's part of that same thing, you know, just building partners together and taking so people know when the air conditioner's out that I'm going to call up my elderly neighbors. Shelter assessment. I'm not someone who's involved with shelters at all, but you know what else is needed for shelters to serve needs. Uh, Chris is involved with us in terms of the microgrid for Snipo. Okay, so those of you who are younger than me or have reading glasses. Oh my. Um, and again, I you know I'm, I'm not going to go through all these because of time. So I'm just going to go through the headings in terms of thinking of these. So um, the first one is, in some ways, the most nebulous, but maybe the most important, is how we just sort of build the conversation. So all the public policies we do in actions, we just sort of think about it through the lens of, of resiliency. Um, so it's not just like, here's a resiliency plan, and here's everything else. To some extent, the point of this whole plan is to do a plan now, but then next year we do the comprehensive plan does that, we're spreading it out. To some extent, frankly, it's in the conversation, so that when something comes to our council, Bill remembers the plan there, and something comes before the planning board, and the planning board remembers how we do those things. And that's true for both boards and departments. Um, design standards, you know, we know most importantly right now, we don't even know what the design standards we should be using. So we, you know, we plan for what's the most likely uh, rainstorm within a 24-hour period based on NRCS maps that were done 40 years ago. One of the things our consultants are doing for us as part of this process is giving recommendations to what those numbers should be. We've been having some conversation regionally because we have a regional design community. It'd be nice not for Northampton and Amherst and Springfield all to be designed around different storms. It's going to be a lot easier for designers we have that. But so a lot of these things sort of are, are deeper into the weeds. Um, uh, and just sort of agreeing, obviously, a lot of this is about DPW in terms of what they design for um, and what the private sector designs for. Wait, how does, how does this uh, fine print section relate to the, the Previous piece that we just went through. Previous piece, they basically they mined it for things that seem most important for conversations. So this has more things, and then has additional columns. But it's still on the strategies. It's still the strategy. What's it? Strategies, and then goes into you know the analysis for co-benefits. You can see it's mostly blank. Yeah. But that's yeah. the idea. So you're, 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 you're going to fill that out. You're, you're going to fill that out, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and then who does the implementation? Yeah. So some things will change. Like, okay. you see the implementation lists are longer or long. I said, if you list everybody who has their fingerprints on things, the lists are going to be incredibly long because everything goes through 20 boards. So this, the implementation should really be who owns it, who's respond, who do we yell at if they don't do it right? Yeah, okay. So not like, you know, things come before the planning board and they approve or don't approve, but they're not actually in charge of the time schedule. So a lot more has to come in this process. Uh, but if you have comments on any of those things, like the precedents, you all may have good examples of, oh, I've seen this you know, something similar in X community, we could fill those in and, and learn from those things. Uh, 
Um, again, so, you know, going to what you're saying, you see under resilient building design, the first one we already talked about is the minimum pre-board requirement. So they took that out for the broader conversation. But there's more things. So they're all, you, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I again, assume the headings now, but, um, so this one says, zoning incentives in education. So in this case, the zoning is the regulatory part. The incentives are what are the things that we can do. This is, and we are trying to look at all these things through a um, equity lens as well. So incentives, we have to be careful about because some of the things, like I always use the example of my PD, which best investment I ever made, and it's your low income, some of your electric bill is supporting my PD, which is very generous. Um, and I, you know, it's sort of like a carbon tax, so I don't object, but we're trying to think about those things. So that's one of the things I'm particularly sensitive about the sentence is, are we subsidizing higher end building and not subsidizing? Um, Four minutes left. Okay, thank you. So capital planning improvements. This could be everything from actual investments, you know, what goes before the Capital Planning Committee. Um, it, could be, it could be grants, what grants do we apply for or not apply for, how do we use the grants. But again, it can also just be a filter. So the Capital Improvements Committee now, when things come before them, one of the questions they always ask is, would this save us an operational cost or cost us an operational cost? But they don't ask, what's its impact on the funds? And so some of these just might be a filter. It doesn't mean we're not going to pay for a fire truck, but it means at least we ask the question you know, for, for doing it. And, and maybe then the fire chief comes back and says, oh, I have two models, and this one's $10,000 more, but you have an extra half mile per gallon, you know, process. Um, I was reading about PBTA. They have buses that get three miles a gallon, buses that get four miles a gallon. And it's only one mile difference, but it's a huge cost in terms of their overall fleet miles. So again, it's a lens for how we're looking at these things. Um, so resilient building design again you you saw these wait, 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 this there I'm sorry I'm wrong direction. Um, so resilience regeneration capacity it's these ecosystems agriculture food systems again we've done lots of these things but I, I and we're speaking of open records, thinking about the systems. So food systems, sorry, I think your example about herbicides and pesticides. So we're not just looking at food systems and chemicals, but you know, how does all things connect together? So So community members, this is the education, it's the soapbox, it's sort of, you know, building community participation. And just race it through. Um, emergency management systems. I think done a good job in the last few years. I'm not sure they did a good job 20 years ago about like we will have a hazard mitigation plan that planning and BBW are, are involved with, and we have emergency operations plan that planning was traditionally not involved with. And so we've done a better job in the last few years of sort of merging those things together so they all talk to each other. And so some of these things fall through. So I think that's. That's my quick, that's my time. Anyway, you're looking for feedback from individual members because there's not, obviously not time for that's right. the commission as a group. Yeah, yeah. right, so, so email me. Um, don't email everyone because that becomes a potential open meeting right. thing. So email right. me. This will come back to you. The revised version will come back to you next month. But again, you know, at each step it gets harder to get input. So the more you can go front, the better. But you're not giving up your chance. And, and remind me the whole process of you know, the workshops and the planning that's, that's going on, you know, the earlier workshops we did. Is that on the planning website, uh, the city website? The PowerPoints just are, sort of, yeah, just sort of, the PowerPoints are, we haven't get, we're waiting for them to revise this product based on our right. things. So we will put that up. Okay. Just so if you want to go back and sort of look at yeah. the evolution of this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah all the PowerPoints are there. They're frankly a little deeply buried in our website, so we're not going to say obvious, but they're all okay. Thanks. Okay. That's a really broad question. So this is a completely separate plan from the 10-year sustainability plan, right? Or For a year. So the idea is, we 
it's really hard to get people involved for two year plan revision process. So rather than doing the, the open up San Leonard Hampton and just getting it for people who can come to 20 meetings, this is back to that equity issue, we looked at what were the weaknesses in the plan and we identified a couple things. Walk bike, so we pulled that out and did a walk bike plan last year, and resiliency and regeneration, so we're doing that now. Then a year for six months from now or a year from now when this is all done, we go back and we open up Sustainable North Hampton. Everything can go, but we hope we've had a lot of the conversations. So then it's, you know, absent community input, we want a lot of community input. It's a, it's a, we take this and sort of put it all in the same spot. So this all folds into that? It all folds. You know, we're looking at it, it's your training wheels. You can try it. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Over there. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then I want to introduce um, Chris Ouellette. And did your last name pronounce? No, I was close, but we didn't, not quite. Would you correct? It's you pronounced uh, Wallet with a, Wallet, like okay. a W. Yep. Okay. Uh, Chris yeah. is with Mitsubishi Electric. And I saw a presentation by him at the National Grids Energy Summit. Um, uh, and I, just all the talk that the commission had been doing around air source heat pumps, I just thought this is really good background information for the commissioners to have. So this is just to kind of give you guys a chance to see what Chris has to say and ask him questions. And um, so we are, when we talk about air source heat pumps, we're talking about it, we're talking about it from in, as a, a more informed um, perspective. Chris, thank you very much for coming out. Yeah, thank you all for having me, Chris. Thanks for the invitation here. So this is just general knowledge. I can answer, try to answer any questions you have, probably be able to answer most of them. Um, and we can come back anytime or as much as we need to to educate you, the town people, anything you need, we'll go back to help. So that's me. I'm a commercial sales engineer from Mitsubishi Electric, um, and Massachusetts is one of my responsibilities. So when we talk about, we're going to talk about air source heat pumps and in very ge very general basis, um, but we're going to go quick because we only have a little bit of time. So there's two types of systems. Uh, it's typically. a half hour. Okay. <clears throat> two types of systems typically we talk about heat pump systems versus heat pump with heat recovery. Uh, I'm already getting some nods, that's good. Um, great. So we're just going to go through those really quick and explain the differences. Um, so of the system types, we really have... Um, it breaks down two different ways. Uh, either heat pump with heat recovery, which is that left column, or heat pump systems. The other way it breaks down is if we're looking at three phase or single phase power. So if you look on that left column, heat pump and heat recovery is what we call VRF, and that is the three phase option. So uh, for smaller, and that's the larger systems, for smaller systems, it's going to be single phase power, which is light commercial, residential type installations. Commercially, it would be the VRF system, typically three phase, and that's up to 30 tons. Can you go back one slide? Of course. So I'm just curious, in terms of low ambient cooling, are we talking about enough that in this area you don't need any supplemental? We're going to talk about that. Okay. Yep. We're going to distinguish between low ambient heating and low ambient cooling. Okay. Yep. So low ambient heating is when we want heat in our buildings when it's really cold out, and low ambient cooling is when we want cooling in our buildings when it's really cold out for our IT rooms, server rooms, uh, emergency operation centers, places like that, okay. that need cooling year round. What's the reason we don't see more VRFs in residential because of the high cost compared to many splits? Uh, three phase, you don't see in many residential homes. Yeah, Three phase power. Because three to five tons seems right in line with residential needs. Is it just oh the high yeah cost? yeah we we see lots of it actually lots of VRFs yeah well so they're all VRF systems that's the heat pumps are VRF systems VRF means variable refrigerant flow so we're just we're varying the flow of the refrigerant to the fan coils so they're all typ technically VRF systems so we're going to go through what you might see residentially versus what you might see commercially hopefully that'll answer some of your questions I think it's Aiden right yep yep. Um, so what all these, whether it's residential or commercial, whether it's three phase or single phase, they all have a certain advantage, and it's the inverter driven compressor that's in the outdoor unit, and that's really the heart of the, the business here. When we compare these, we first like to compare them to conventional systems, so these would be your on-off systems, probably what's running in this building. Um, with conventional systems, 
Um, what you'll see is, and the red lights don't work on the new screens, but our compressor comes on to 60 hertz. That's as high as it'll run on conventional equipment. And it takes us a while to get down to our uh, desired set point. And once we hit it, we shut off. Shut the unit off and we heat up generally above set point. There's usually a differential set there. And then we come back on again and this cycle continues to repeat. Certainly uncomfortable, certainly inefficient, high starting currents. Uh, for any of you that got uh, old furnaces in your house when the lights dim when it comes on, that's the high amp draw of your system pulling the other parts of your electrical panel down. The other thing is with systems like this, your on off is terrible for equipment. It's just like a car or a pump or a motor. The more you turn it off, the more you turn it on, the more it shortens its life. That, that's pretty well understood. With inverter driven compressors, um, first of all, when we start, we have a, a soft start, so our uh, initial amp draw isn't very high, and we, we wind the compressor up, so to speak. And then you'll notice that we come on and we're allowed to run much higher than 60 hertz. The advantage to that is it gives us a set point quickly. So we become comfortable in our space quickly. From there, it's the inverter driven compressor takes over and what we do is we only input enough energy into the compressor to maintain the space temperature. No more and no less. So it's really like running your car on cruise control. Okay? Um, makes, makes sense, right? So, um, do you have natural gas in town? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of natural gas boilers. Mm -hmm. The high efficiency boilers work on the same principle. Long run times at low inputs equals high efficiency. That's really what we're getting at here. Um, any questions on that? Excellent. So we're gonna jump back into the heat pump versus heat recovery systems now that we all know that these all have inverter driven compressors. So a heat pump system is just that. It's a heat pump system. You have an outdoor unit, which is on the, we'll look at the blue side first, on the left there, that box is the con condenser with the compressor in it. And we'll feed into a system with two refrigerant pipes. They're very small pipes, typically uh, inch and a quarter and five eighths um, or smaller coming into the building, two pipes. Uh, and then we just branch off with T's to hit all these fan coils. We can control each fan coil individually to its own set temperature, or we can put a thermostat on the wall and run it to that set temperature, which would be typical for a space like this. We can put one thermostat in there and run all three, six, nine of those fan coils. We can actually run up to 16 fan coils with one thermostat. Now one of the hidden magic things in here is we can tell the room set temperature to be 70 degrees. But we can tell the system to look at the return air of each one of those fan coils and have it act independently of all the others. So if we had a group of people that were all in the front of that auditorium, those front fan coils would be working hard to maintain the people's heat, cool their people that are giving off the heat in the back of the room, those would probably be off. So there's inherent energy savings built into these systems um, just by their intrinsic design. Now, a little quick history on heat pumps. They're about 40 years old. Uh, they came from the Far East. Uh, they've been in the States about 30 years, give or take. Um, so what that means is this is essentially a mature product. It's been well vetted and engineered. And when I say that, this is a completely engineered product. So first screw to last screw, everything in between, we engineer, we make the control boards, we write the logic, we make the compressors. Um, so you can think of it more of a, uh, a machine than just a boiler or a chiller or something like that. It's, it's a package system. Um, oops. Can you just, on that theme, can you talk about where it's going, like how fast the things developed over those 30 years? Because I know just in the last couple years there's been big jumps in technology and engineering. So, oh, yeah. And where is it going from here? Yeah, excellent question. So your mom and dad's, your grandparents' heat pump, shut off at 47 degrees. That was probably about 30 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, we got them down to about 17 degrees and they'd shut off. They just, you'd run the compressor too hard and they wouldn't be able to run. Um, current equipment, we're running down to negative 25 Fahrenheit. Um, I don't think it's colder than that here. It may, I don't know. 
Um, and our next generation, um, we're, which is due out probably in the next year, we're going to see um, operation temperatures into the negative 30s. Does that mean that it's going to maintain efficiency and capacity at so, zero and five? And yes, so there's D rates as it gets colder out. The current cold weather equipment will produce 100% of nominal capacity at zero. Wow. Yes, yeah. And then it the derates after that. The newest equipment, and we haven't decided on the final engineering of it, um, is probably going to be 60 to 70% of your heat, nominal heating at minus 20 degrees. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. So, so does the, does the um, how does the, I mean, I know the efficiency of the unit decreases, does that, does that also mean the the uh, the uh, the output of the unit decreases? Does it, is the decrease in the is the decrease in in efficiency a straight line that parallels that? It, it isn't. So uh, we measure efficiencies by COP, which is coefficient of performance, mm -hmm. which essentially is uh, amount of energy in mm -hmm. divided by amount amount of energy out. Um, our current equipment at Ooh, I'm gonna have to think for a second, but our current equipment at say minus 13, which is where we kind of put our engineering manuals to, is probably still a COP of one and a half, 1.3. So that means it's essentially 130% efficient. Mm -hmm. So one is equivalent to like electric baseboard. Right? Exactly. That's the way to think about it. Yep, one is, one is electric baseboard. You put in one kilowatt energy, it produces one kilowatt out. Heat pumps, you put in one kilowatt of energy, you get 1.3 kilowatts out. And that's the, one of the magic things is, yes, we're using an electrically driven compressor to move the refrigerator around, but we're using um, the refrigeration cycle, which allows us to extract heat from the air. So even though it's zero out, there's molecules moving around, and that's energy. And we can pull that energy into the refrigerant right through the coil. So we're, we're extracting energy from the air and putting it into the building. And just to be clear, higher temperatures, it's a COP of three. I mean, it's oh, three higher we get, you know, as we're shoulder shot. season, we'll see COPs of four and five. Yeah. Um, so that's 500 percent efficient. So the warmer is outside, the much more efficient this equipment is. So at 40 degrees, you're at three, you'd say. Yeah, you're probably been higher than that. Yep. And then the other side of it is, it is on the cooling side. Um, in that in that case, we're taking the heat out of the building, and that's really easy to do. So we're, for our cooling purposes, are I would never call them free, but they're very inexpensive to run in cooling. And that's just part of the design. So you're getting heating and cooling in one system. These are great questions, by the way, and I'm not patting you on the back. So, um, so what is a heat pump system? An outdoor unit, a condenser on the top there, on the left. Uh, the bottom one is a water-cooled uh, condenser, which goes inside a building. We'll cross that bridge if we get to it with you guys in the town. And then you'd pick a, a style of fan coil for the indoor, uh, quite popular for residences. At the top one is the wall hung unit. You might see very uh, European. We have ducted units that would go above a ceiling and uh, provide duct work to, to the to space like this. We could put ducts in and hit all these spaces with one fan coil above the ceiling. Uh, floor mounted units for common spaces, say, and then ceiling cassettes, which go up in a ceiling and spread the air around. So outdoor unit, fan coils, and then some controls, which are our controls. Like I said, these are all engineered systems, proprietary controls that we provide. If this is being done to retrofit a house that already has a good either air system or water system, can these have be installed in the basement and sort of feed into that overall district? No, these are packaged systems. Okay. Yep. yep. I mean, you can't have centrally ducted heat pumps. You guys make them, but yes, you, you just do. add them to an old duct system. Yeah, they'd be parallel. Yeah. So they're not going to integrate. Well, so you could, yes, two different things here. So we could, they had an old furnace. We could tear that out. We have a fan coil, as Ian was saying, that plugs right into that and use our equipment in their duct work. Oh, you could have. Yeah. That. So okay. um, then we'd have to change the condenser outside. Okay. But they removed. The, those old ones had an air conditioning coil inside it, yeah. but that now it goes outside with the okay. answer. Really? Okay. Yep. And is the same thing true for if you have forced air and forced water? Uh, no, forced water would be completely different. Okay. But if you had a good old forced water system, what we might suggest is putting in one of our systems and not buy the super duper, super heating one, 
let it keep down as far as it can and then switch over to the other system. If it's still an old and viable system yep. or a newer system, there's no reason to scrap it. You know, might as well get some more longevity out of it since you already paid for it or are paying for it. So outdoor unit, indoor units, and controls. That makes up a heat pump system. Um, and off we go. So where would you see those? Certainly restaurants, lobbies, churches, anywhere that a building or a space is going to have the same load profile. Meaning we can heat, it's all going to need heating or all going to need cooling. We can get tricky with the, those designs, so we can even find a building that doesn't think it's that way, and we can show you how you can lay it out so it works that way. And the advantage of using heat pumps versus heat recovery is just simply first cost. It's less money, because you're getting less, and you'll see what you're getting less of. So that's heat pump applications. Um, now heat pump with heat recovery, this is heating and cooling at the same time. Simultaneous heating and cooling. And this is that three-phase system, and it's the only way you can get it would be three-phase. So it looks like we have that same condenser outside and a relatively same setup with fan coils inside. But if you follow that outdoor unit to that first uh, connection there, you'll see a box. And that's a branch circuit controller. And that does the heat exchanging for us. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit here. Um, so what's different from the last system we saw is simply that second piece there, that branch circuit controller. Same controls. Exactly. Same fan coils exactly as a heat pump. We've added that VC controller and we've selected a different outdoor unit. So if you had a heat pump system and you say, oh darn, that's not what I wanted. I really wanted heat recovery. You can't just add the box. You need to change the outdoor unit too. So it's a decision you want to make at the beginning of the product. Um, now here's how this kind of works, the heat recovery systems. On a typical day, so uh, with this time of year, it's the morning, your building's in a building warm-up, all the fan coils are heating just to take that, that night set back off so people can come in and be relatively comfortable. Then, um, you know, let's call, it a, let's call it a Northampton windy 30 degree day. In this building? Yeah. On the second floor. <laughs> there you go. So then the sun comes up and starts beating on those windows. Those windows. Yep. Um, and while we're cold, really on the shadowy side of the building it still needs heat, these guys want some cooling. We just, I'll show you what we're doing in a minute. No problem there. Um, then you guys decided to have one of these meetings over here, and that unit just went from heating to cooling. As long as we size those particular fan coils for the space type they're going to be serving, so if you knew it was a, a, a boardroom that held 50 people, we'd have to, an engineering would build it to 50 people. Um, we'd be fine to go, good to go. So in this case, instead of, remember I told you we're pulling in the summertime, we're pulling the heat out of this space and dumping it outside. We're re rejecting heat from the building. Well, thermodynamically, heat moves to cold. That's what it does. So the units that are in cooling are absorbing that heat that we were in the heat pump system rejecting to the outside of the building. So now we take that heat, we put it back into the refrigerant, we move it back to that branch circuit box, and send it out to the guys that need heating. So, I hate this slide. I should probably change it. Uh, it's not free. Nothing's free in this world. We, we've learned that, right? You guys are in your position, in your car, because you have the common sense to know nothing's free. But it is, reduces your energy load, because it's taking from somewhere else in the building and putting it somewhere else in the building. Because even if we're in a perfect, mix 50% heating, 50% cooling, that outdoor unit's still gonna have to run to a degree to push the refrigerator around. So there's gonna be some energy draw. So I just wanna be make sure we're clear there. But it does switch the heat back and forth. And would it be the case that because you're pulling uh, heat out of a, a warm room, instead of the cold outdoors, that your COP goes way up? It does go up, yep. Yeah. Absolutely, that right. So yeah, so if we're in a a uh, complete balanced heat recovery. Uh, I'd have to look what the COPs are, but uh, yes, they go significantly up. Right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And so where we apply those, certainly schools, offices, assisted living facilities, multifamily housing complexes are pretty common to see this stuff. Really anywhere you think you're going to need simultaneous heating and cooling. Certainly office spaces are a big hit for us in the Boston market. Um, we can always help kind of define these spaces and as space use types for you to find out what the best systems are. The other thing a heat pump, heat recovery system gives us is we're able to design with diversity. So what that means is 
um, we can put more fan coil BTUs inside the space than we're able to take care of. So a 10 ton unit outside, I can actually put 15 tons of equipment inside because we know in some applications that not all those fan coils are gonna be calling for all their requirement every time all day, right? Uh, think about it this way. We see a lot of uh, newer, newer spaces, um, really tight buildings. An office may have a load of 3,000 BTUs. Well, my smallest fan coil is 6,000 BTUs. So I already know I got 3,000 extra BTUs there to get somewhere else. So we can put more inside the building than we're using outside the building. Gives us some money savings there. Uh, we already saw about the uh, occupant diversity. So as the people move around the space, we can adjust to that. Um, I think I get a little, yeah, so I get a little example here. Um, so in this case, 14 tons indoors, only 12 tons outdoors. Now that outdoor unit can only ever produce 12 tons. So in chance, if everything was calling for heating at the same time, we would just split that extra two tons of lost capacity up between all the units. So not the end of the world. And it's really, rarely does it happen, especially on the cooling side. Diversity in cooling is very, very common. Typical controllers. So I, I brought this slide. Um, typically in a residential uh, commercial space, you'll see that second one in from the left, a simple MA, very basic control for an occupant. Um, the one on the left we would use in municipal buildings a lot in the common spaces, the hallways, the rooms that you don't want people messing around with the temperature so you don't see that thermostat on the wall, just a button sensor and you can control the temperature removal. Uh, the next two are more advanced controllers for uh, individual programming. Typically, commercially, we don't, we don't need those. And we'll save you the money. And then all those controls tie back to a central controller. The one on the left is our more common one, the 8200. It's a color touchscreen central controller. And it allows you to operate C, monitor, prohibit all the fan coils in the space. So you could set it up and say, um, this space, for example, you can say, well, this municipal building, everyone's got a jacket, we can leave it at 66 degrees all day. Even if we had a thermostat on the wall, they could hit the button all day, but that's not going to ever change the space temperature because we prohibited it. Same thing on the heating side or the cooling side. Um, you can also do all the scheduling from here. So if you said, hey, uh, uh, we're looking at school and we got the custodial crew coming in overnight to do a wing of the building floors, clean the floors, where you just have that wing on and give them some comfort or whatever temperature they need for the waxing of the floors. So all kinds of different things. Um, it also allows you to use your buildings at night or off hours or off peak for other applications and just put on the fan coils that are going to use those spaces. You don't have to bring the whole system up and up to run. Uh, here's the capacities we were talking about. So the dark red and light red, the dark red is listed in our engineering manual. So if you go in our engineering manual, you'll see ratings, guaranteed ratings down to minus 13 degrees. The light red is um, functionally where they'll operate to. We just don't give you a rating down there for anymore. So that hyperheat system, which is probably applicable out here quite a bit, uh, minus 13 we rated to, it'll run to minus 25. Chris, in the, um, we're getting close to the half yep. hour. Um, uh, I'm, I'd be curious, it's kind of like talking about the application uh, in uh, existing buildings. Mm -hmm. now, the city owns a bunch of buildings, schools, other other old buildings out there. What do you see for application uh, for us? And I know there was an interest. I, I think residential has been kind of covered a bit. At least I know you wanted it from last time. But uh, can you just talk about some, you know, where do you see these going in in existing buildings? Yeah, so the only, I can tell you, let's go to the other side. The only place I don't see them going in is large warehouse spaces, box stores. Um, you know, that's really about it. Everywhere else seems to fit. So we do a lot of retrofit in the greater Boston market, really everywhere. Sometimes it's more smaller systems, depending on because the building's all old and chunked up and you can't get from here to there. So we might do very localized systems to each part of the building. That's sometimes an advantage. We use less refrigerant piping, which keeps the cost down. And we can zone the building then by really by, uh, you know, um, exposure type, which allows us maybe to go to heat pumps from heat recovery and save some money. 
Um, we get lots of flexibility in total pipe in a system, elevations between outdoor units and indoor units, really never a concern commercially. Um, so old schools, old certain retrofit multifamily housing, we see a lot of that down in the in all the mill towns. Um, so uh, so the poor insulation level, go ahead. No, yeah. I was just gonna ask, so elaborate on, you know, working in, in smaller clustered areas because of the way the building might be chopped up or old or yep. lack of insulation. Some guidelines for figuring out, let's say I've got five rooms I want to take care of. Um, do you do look at four head condensers or do you look at a two and a three? What are some yeah, guidelines? Yeah, so we, we would do that. There's no, um, so VRF design is as much an art as it is a science. Yeah. So the art part is us. I'm the artist here. We look at a design and then we paint a picture. So there's no set rules. It's really application based for every job. And that's, you know, when you send me something, um, the first question I'm gonna ask you is what's the application? What are we doing? Um, always, that's always my first question. If it's not in the email or the phone call, what are we, what are we doing? Is it residential or is it commercial? Is there existing heat? Isn't there existing heat? But to your point, yes, you might do that. You might do a two, two zone system and a three zone system. We have small, small systems for the residential style systems. Um, or, you know, the other thing it does too is when we start breaking the units up, because they don't have to all be together, it lessens the burden if we're putting them on a roof. We can spread the weight around an old roof, which is nice. Um, and I said the localized, and we would typically design localized too, to keep the piping costs down as much as we can. Yep. Um, this is not a cheap technology, um, but it's, a, it's a, an effective technology. It's very minimal maintenance on these systems, which is a huge thing for, on your side of the equation. Um, as you see, there's a lot to talk about. I think I'm already out of time, and we didn't even get to touch the residential side of things. You can um, a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> Just a few minutes. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Residential side, um, these are all going to be heat pumps. Uh, we have the M series, which is residential, and you can see the styles of fan coils there that are offered. Um, and typically in the residential area out here, we only be looking at hyperheat systems, which is 100% down to zero and rated to minus 13. Some of these you can get in cooling only. It's very not typical these days to do that. Um, and I'll just give you a quick rundown here. So, oh, excuse me, 100% to five degrees on the hyperheat stuff. Um, and these are can be single zone, meaning one outdoor unit to one indoor unit, or we have multi-zone systems. Um, the single zone systems, you have two options, a wall and a floor mounted unit. So each one of those indoor units on the right would get its own outdoor unit. Uh, so, so if you had a building or an old home that just couldn't get across places, you might put a few of these in a building or in a home. And then we have a multi-zone system, which is one outdoor unit to multiple indoor units. And this is really the popular one these days. And when we talk about multi-zone systems, just so we know, this port type, which means each one of the fan coils, hey, it's working out. Each one of the fan coils pipes directly back to the condenser. And that's two and three zone systems. And then we have this other style where you pipe to this branch box and then pipe to up to eight fan coils. Um, so if you have a lot of rooms in a house, or sometimes we'll do it by floor. A three zone maybe, uh, four zone upstairs, and you know, four bedrooms and two zones downstairs, kitchen, living, and dining. Yep. Another like question that. about the ceiling cassettes, I'm seeing more of those in residential. Yep. Um, how do they impact, like it's another penetration into the attic? Are they like pretty hard tight? Can they be in cold attics? You have to they they can be unconditioned spaces, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so as long as they're like air sealed into the flush of the ceiling, they're good. We're not concerned about it. Yeah, the only thing, I, you, know, you could just have them open to it into an attic space. Yeah. Um, as long as, you know, and I, you know, we see commercially some of the fire codes make you put a firebox around them. But typically we don't. They just, they be cut right into this space, into this funnel. But they're pretty airtight, so think in an, in an attic. I mean, there's not, I mean, it's a bunch of metal, so there's not air coming from the attic through them. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, yeah. So yeah, so we return through the center of the, into the unit itself, yeah. and we uh, supply out to the four veins. So it's recirculating its own air. It's not taking air from up in the attic. So no, it's a vent in itself. Yeah, it's an airtight box. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 
doesn't that degrade or decay the efficiency of the atom? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. No, no. So that's the branch box type. And, you know, the bigger they are, the bigger the outdoor unit. Um, you can see that one's uh, uh, four or four and a half feet tall. Um, <coughs> they're big, but it's what, what you use. Um, and then quickly on the residential controls, most common is a wireless thermostat. Um, for those of you who know the T87, the Honeywell, the old dial that everyone had in their house, this is the modern version of that. Um, it's wall mounted, put a couple of batteries in it, and then it talks to the fan coil without having any wires go to the fan coil. And that's probably 80 to 90% of our residential installations. Um, the other option is we have a phone app. So you plug in a little adapter and you use your phone to control it. Uh, that's pretty robust actually. We're getting some pretty good feedback on that one. What happens when the electricity goes out and your Wi-Fi router sits down? We don't have any magic. No, no, no internet, no, no heat. No heat. But if you lose your power, you're not going to have. Well, if you don't lose power to the heat pump, it'll stay in its last minute. So Chris, now we are out of it. Yes. Awesome. Well, like, like I said, I can come back and, and I gladly come back anytime you guys need it and okay. talk to you for anyone who's coming. I'll talk for one of those zero people for a thousand. If anybody has any further questions, pass them to me. I'll pass them up to you. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I only got a few business cards, but uh, Chris, I believe you have mine. And you get willing to share it, right? Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Wish we had a few more minutes. Um, and I guess I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll uh, move to adjourn, please. Second. All favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Probably turn the lights on. Yeah,